Welcome to Equipping Hour. Well, October 31st is approaching, which is Reformation Day. That's the, the day on the calendar when we remember October 1517 when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg protesting the abuse and the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church who was selling indulgences. And so we've been taking the five Sundays of October to remember each of the five great salvation distinctives of the Reformation. The five solas, sola scriptura, sola gratia, solus Christus, sola fide, sola, soli deo gloria, scripture alone, grace alone, Christ alone, faith alone, to God alone be the glory. And chief among the reformers' concern was that the Roman Catholic Church had subverted the gospel of grace by setting up a sacramental system of works righteousness in its place. Uh, Martin Luther's study of the New Testament, especially the New Testament phrase, the just shall live by faith, set him on a path to understanding the true gospel. And God would use Luther as a key part of the great recovery of the gospel known as the Reformation. And this morning, we're going to be looking at the means by which one can take hold of that salvation by faith alone or sola fide. And Sinclair Ferguson wrote, justification by grace alone through faith alone has stood at the center of evangelical theology ever since Martin Luther's famous insistence that the church stands or falls with this doctrine. Luther wrote, this, this doctrine, is the main hinge on which religion turns so that we devote the greater attention and care to it. And so we, this morning we we look at that great doctrine of justification by faith alone. And the Roman Catholic Church would later denounce Martin Luther as a heretic and excommunicate him. Luther was accused of not being a revolution, uh, or was accused of being a revolutionary um, and, or an innovator, teaching a new meaning of justification. Today, Luther and the reformers are accused of believing a false gospel that denied scripture and denied the authority of the church, and also of inventing a false gospel that was never believed in the 15, first 1,500 years of the church. Now, they're accused of innovation, not of recovering what was lost. And so sadly, even many in the evangelical church, even those who embrace the Reformation understandings of faith alone, nevertheless have often accepted the notion that these things just weren't ever believed in the history of the church until the time of the Reformation. They might say we can believe these things are true because Scripture says it to be true, but we just need to accept the fact that these things really weren't believed in the church until relatively recently, in the last 500 years. So this morning, we will seek to answer, number one, does Scripture teach justification by faith alone? And number two is, if justification by faith is true, was the church really without a true gospel witness for 1,500 years of church history? Were Luther and the Reformers really the first to believe in church history and to understand the gospel biblically? Well, so where are we going today? Well, to let you know the path, the issue of the gospel was not settled 500 years ago during the Reformation. Or rather, it was settled long before Luther came in the pages of Scripture. And if we believe the rallying cry of the Reformation, sola scriptura, Scripture alone, God's Word alone is all the testimony we need to the truthfulness of any doctrine, including justification by faith. So this morning, we're going to first look at the sufficient testimony of justification by faith from Scripture. But was there really no faithful gospel witness throughout the first 1,500 years of the church on something as crucial as justification by faith? 
Well, the answer is unequivocally no. The gospel was settled in the pages of the scripture. And though dark times would come for the church, we'll see a taste of some of the evidence this morning that there were indeed faithful witnesses to justification by faith alone throughout church history. And so time permitting, we'll look next at the supporting testimony of justification by faith from church history. So those are the two points. We may get to spend less time on the second than we desire, so I may be giving you some resources to chase this down a little further. But let's dive into how the cherished doctrine of the Protestant doctrine of justification by faith alone can be traced all the way back to Christ and the Bible. So first we'll look at the sufficient testimony of justification by faith from Scripture, and we'll do that first by looking at the nature of justification. Uh, the nature of justification at the very heart of the gospel is justification. The reformers understood justification to be the forensic, justi- the forensic declaration by God in which God pardons sinners by forgiving their sin and then declaring them to be righteous. And so we'll first look at what is this notion of forensic. So point number one is justification is forensic. The prevailing Roman Catholic teaching during the 16th century viewed justification as a process, a process where sinners gradually were made righteous over the course of their entire lives. And the reformers rejected that, arguing, no, that justification is actually an immediate change in the status of the believer before God, to which a believer contributes nothing. It is entirely a work of God. And so the Latin term forensic refers to the law court. It's a legal term. Uh, Today we use the term forensic about forensic science to speak to the detection of crime. But it originally meant in open court or in a public, public forum where we get forensic And this law court language is embedded within the vocabulary and the biblical term justification. And so turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, we will look at this forensic nature of justification. Romans 8, verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. So notice the courtroom language in this passage, bringing a charge against someone, condemnation, and even intercession by an advocate, as you might see in court. Look at verse 33. God is the one who justifies who declares righteous. The picture is here in this verse that nobody can bring a charge against us in a court because God has already rendered his judgment. He, our condemnation is null and void because God has declared us righteous. Nobody can bring a charge of unrighteousness against those whom God has already declared to be righteous. And look at verse 34. Notice that what Christ's intercession is contrasted against. Christ's intercession is contrasted against our condemnation. Condemnation is the legal verdict of guilty or unrighteous. But our condemnation is rendered null and void void by what? Christ interceding on our behalf. He pleads our case on our behalf. And notice, even in this passage, Paul defines on what basis Jesus can be our advocate and intercede on our behalf. What qualifies him to do this? Notice verse 34, the second half of it. Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. God's legal verdict is that we are righteous 
And Christ's intercession for us overturned the valid charges against us and overturned our fair condemnation. And this was accomplished not by our merit, but by Jesus' death, his resurrection, his ascension to God's right hand that qualified him to intercede on our behalf. So justification is forensic in nature. It involves legal charges and a legal status change. It is the declaration by God that we are righteous. It's not a process where we're made righteous, where we're made deserving. It is the declaration that we are righteous. And and God declared us righteous when we were anything but righteous. When God justifies the believer, it is only positionally. He declares us righteous positionally, uh, in his eyes, but not yet by practice. Because we were, at the time that God justified us, who are in Christ, we were still very much in our sin to that moment. But Romans 4, chapter 5 says, God justifies the ungodly. God doesn't justify the righteous. God justifies the ungodly. He declares those who are ungodly to be righteous. So justification is, number one, forensic. It's also, number two, declarative. Declarative. You've heard us say that to justify means to declare righteous and not to make righteous. And so we're to understand justification is that it is declarative. It is not transformative in that moment. This declarative nature of justification is first evident by just looking at some passages that talk about God being justified. So turn to 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifested in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. That word vindicated there is the same word that we translate justified. So two two different translations of the same Greek word. This is vindication and justification are one and the same here. Clearly, Christ, in this instant, was not being made righteous, right? Christ has always been righteous. Well, then what's, what's, being, what's in view in this passage that Christ is justified or he's vindicated? He was already morally perfect, but he can be declared righteous by those who recognize and those who praise him for his holiness, for his righteousness. So Jesus' righteousness in this passage is here is shown or manifested or declared to be by the Holy Spirit. And then it's witnessed by angels, and then it's further declared or proclaimed among the nations. For Christ, there was no status change at the declaration of his righteousness. Where Christ's justification is different than ours is that we were only proclaimed righteous positionally, but for Christ, it was always true of him. However, in both Christ's justification and and ours, what it is is a declaration of righteousness. So turn to 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 4, the other passage up there for this section. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 3. And on on his face, this passage doesn't deal with justification in a sense of our salvation, but it does use the term justification, which helps us understand the definition. But to me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself, but yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. In verse 4, four, the word that is translated acquitted here is again the same Greek word translated as justified or vindicated. 
So note, and note again the, the courtroom language in this passage, dealing with justification. The, there's a human court, there's an examination, and then an acquittal. And in this passage, Paul again uses the word justified, but he's not using it in the context of the, of the justification of salvation. But he's still very much using it in the very literal sense of being declared righteous. So, so what's going on in this passage? Paul says, you know, I've looked at my motives, and I've looked at my desires, and I've looked at my actions, and as far as I can tell, I can't see any sin present here. Uh, I'm, but I'm not acquitted by this. I'm not justified by this. I can't declare myself to be righteous in this regard because there are hidden motives, hidden desires taking place inside of me that I just can't see. So I can never declare my actions and my motives to be completely sinless or righteous in any given circumstance. I just can't justify myself. Only God can declare me to be righteous in an individual circumstance. Because he sees at the heart level what I rightly, what I can't rightly see. And this is a really helpful corrective to us when our inner sense of justice rises up within us and we are ready to defend our own motives before another. And, and that's not what a right understanding of the heart should lead us to. But that's a separate message. Um, but what I want to point out in this passage this morning is that Paul isn't talking about being made righteous. He isn't saying that I can't make myself righteous, but rather I can't declare myself to be righteous. Only God can do that. So even in this non-salvation passage's use of the word, it still carries that same nuance here of a declaration of righteousness. So we've seen that justification is forensic, it is declarative, and now next we'll see that justification involves an alien righteousness, an alien righteousness. <clears throat> While justification is the one-time event where we are declared righteous, it's important for us to consider the source of that righteousness. Where does that righteousness come from? Well, let's look together at Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God upon faith. Notice Paul says, even after knowing Christ, that he doesn't have his own righteousness. He, his righteousness as a believer is by being found in Christ. And it comes from God. The righteousness that results from justification is that we receive a righteousness from outside of oneself. It is an alien righteousness. Well, Roman Catholic theology teaches that in view of sanctification, the progressive growth in righteousness as part of justification, such that believers' works contribute to their righteous standing before God. But we, we can't conflate these two. Uh, justification and sanctification are distinct. Sanctification or our growth in holiness is a fruit of our justification. And it takes place progressively over a believer's entire life. The one who has been justified and born again can and will respond to God in humble, imperfect obedience, gradually conform more and more into the image of Jesus Christ until this mortal life is over. And while true believers will progressively be made righteous, or made holy, this holiness is the fruit of justification, the fruit of regeneration, not the cause of it. In justification, we are declared to be righteous positionally in an instant. 
And then the rest of the, our lives, the Holy Spirit is working in us through faith and by obedience to gradually make us more and more like Christ as we put off sin in our lives. However, even though Christ begins to gradually make us like him after declaring us to be righteous, our best faith-filled, spirit-empowered efforts in this life do not rid us of all sin. Remember, even Paul knew that his own motives were tainted by sin. And yet Paul still sees himself as a believer, not having a righteousness of his own. On the day we die, we are still found acceptable, not based on any growth in godliness during our believing life, although there should have been growth, but solely on the basis of Christ's righteousness alone. And when we confuse justification and sanctification, the inevitable conclusion is that the believer's personal holiness contributes, at least in part, to his or her right standing before God. All right, and that's, and that's to be rejected. So then how do we take hold of this alien righteousness, this outside righteousness for ourselves? Well, number four on the nature of justification is that justification is the imputation of God's righteousness to our account. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ became sin on our behalf on our behalf, he absorbed the penalty of our sin so we might receive the benefit of his righteousness, being found in him, being clothed in his righteousness, not our own. We already looked at Philippians 3, and in justification, we get the benefit of a righteousness that is not our own, that we're given credit for. On what basis do we get credit for another's righteousness? And it's the righteousness which is from God upon faith. Philippians 3, 9. Turn to Romans 4. Romans 4. We'll unpack this a little bit. Romans 4, verse 3. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. It was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not counted according to grace, but according to what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes upon him, who places their faith upon him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. God counted Abraham righteous when he believed or exercised faith in God, and his faith was counted as righteousness. So if you wrote Romans 4, skip down to verse 22, verse 22 of Romans 4. Therefore, it was also counted to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was counted to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be counted, to those who believe upon him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over on account of our transgressions and was raised on account of our justification. This is the great exchange. Jesus is our substitute. Our sins were counted or credited or imputed to him, whereas justification is a legal term, Imputation is an accounting or a marketplace term. And so he died when our sins were credited to him. And we are saved because God's righteousness is credited to us. And these last two passages we looked at have brought us to the means of our justification. Faith. Not faith plus works, but faith alone. Faith in Christ alone. So we've looked at the nature of justification. We now turn to the nature of faith. The nature of faith. 
And let's just read, let me read from Philippians 3.9 one more time. You can stay in Romans. Philippians 3.9, And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God, upon faith. In Romans 4, we previously read that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Well, let's look back a little bit further to Romans 3. Romans 3, you can turn to Romans 3, you should be in Romans already. We'll look at Romans 3, verse 28. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Justification comes by faith then, but what is faith? Is, is faith a work? Well, the first component of the nature of faith is that faith is a gift, not a work. We're already in Romans 3. Look at verse 22. Verse 22 of Romans 3. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. Everyone who believes gets the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For there is no distinction. Verse 23. For all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Faith is not a work. It is a gift caused by God, given by God, brought about by regeneration. Men are called to believe or to exercise faith in God. And if you don't know Christ, you are called to believe in him today. But God is the one who enables and prompts this saving faith that makes us alive so that we can actually respond to his gospel call. Turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. A few books to the right. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Familiar passage. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith is a gift. And what is faith? Faith is, is faith just a mental assent to facts presented? Well, the second component of the nature of faith is that faith is, and this is a little bit of a mouthful, is a knowing, confident, assurance and entrustment of oneself to the truth. We can put the next point up there. Faith is a knowing, confident, assurance and entrustment of oneself to the truth. I'll just read from Hebrews 11, stay in Ephesians. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So faith is a conviction. It's a conviction that what God has said is absolutely true and trustworthy. It's being convinced and acting in accordance with that conviction. Faith understands the truth to be believed. It is persuaded by the truth as it is revealed. And it wholly entrusts itself to that truth and him who gave it. That's faith. Furthermore, look at the third component of faith is that faith is evidenced by the action it takes faith is evident by the action that it takes and we've been listening carefully to the words of the apostle paul who has clearly stated that justification or being declared righteous is something that came to us when we were ungodly God declared us righteous before there had been any righteousness present. It was a declaration of our legal position before God. And, but it was also simultaneously a forward-looking declaration of what he would ultimately produce in us. When we finally stand before him, we leave this mortal life, and it's a process that he would begin from the moment of our justification all the way until our final glorification. And the righteousness that he progressively works to create in us was 
something that would have begun at that positional declaration. And, and Paul clearly has stated that justification is not by works. Right? We just read Ephesians 2, 8. Let's read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. Salvation is not by works. But what does Paul say immediately after saying that salvation is not by works? The very next verse, Ephesians 2.10, For we are his workmanship. We don't earn our salvation by God, but we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God made us for good works. We're not justified them, but rather we walk in them because we've been justified, because we've been declared righteous, because we love our Savior. According to Paul, works have a very clear role in the Christian life after we've been justified. But they contribute nothing to earning our salvation. But I know my Bibles. Did the Apostle James have a different message? Didn't James say we're justified by works and not by faith alone? Well, looking at James 2 is especially worthy of our time when we're talking about faith alone this morning. So turn to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And beginning in verse 14 of James chapter 2. James is addressing a question about the role of works in the life of a believer. Note that he's addressing the question of the role of life, the role of works in the life of a believer. He's not focusing on what role do works have in the life of, a, of an unbeliever right now. And how some, so read in verse 14, what use is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. It's dead if it's not accompanied by works. See, James says faith without works can't save anyone. Faith without works is dead. Is he, he must be contradicting Paul. Well, let's stand back for a second. We already saw Paul clearly stated that works don't save us. And then that we are saved and justified by faith alone apart from works. But did Paul mean we don't then perform good works? Of course not. Right, Ephesians 2.10, we were created for good works and we walk in them. It's just that good works are the result of our salvation, not the cause of our salvation. But good works are the necessary and consequential fruit of salvation, not the cause. So in James 2 then, consider, what's the context of this chapter? Is it an appeal for how one can obtain salvation? You've got to do works. No, the entire chapter is talking to those who are already professing to be Christians. Even in verse 14, we're dealing with a professing Christian, right? Verse 14, if someone says he has faith. So these are people that are claiming, I have faith. They're not asking the question of how do I come to faith? How do I get justification? They're claiming to already be possessors of it. So the context in chapter 2 is not how to be saved, but rather a helpful perspective on evaluating the credibility of one's profession of faith, of someone who claims to have faith, but yet there are no works in their life that have resulted from that faith. If good works are a necessary fruit of salvation, someone who claims he has faith but isn't walking in the good works prepared for him, then there is every reason to question whether that person has genuine faith. So James 2 is about evaluating, or better yet, demonstrating the genuineness of one's faith. If someone's faith hasn't resulted in good works, 
if good works can't be seen after his supposed salvation, then clearly his faith is dead. It was a false faith. So let's continue in James 2. Let's look at verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Notice the emphasis of faith here. Show me your faith. James was looking for the visible evidence of faith. Faith is evidenced by action. Without action following faith, the faith was useless or dead. It wasn't true, genuine faith. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Here we see clearly faith is more than just mental assent to facts. Demons know facts. But faith involves a conviction that results in a life completely entrusting itself to what has been believed. And and genuine faith acts in accordance with those convictions. It results in a life that is increasingly characterized by living in conformity with those convictions. A work that was begun by God at the moment of our justification. Verse 20. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of his works, faith was perfected or made complete. So here that we see that in the language of James, Abraham was justified by his works when he offered up Isaac on the altar in obedience to the Lord's command. Well, Abraham's faith and belief in God was active and working, and it resulted in his obedience to the Lord, and and James describes it as being justified by works. But think back to when we first started. Do you remember some of the different translations of the word justified that we've already seen just in our brief time together this morning? We've, of course, seen the word justified, which means a declaration of righteousness, and usually in a, it's in a legal sense, and in the context of man's salvation, it speaks of positional justification, of being declared righteous positionally. But we've also seen it take place and be translated as the word vindicated. Remember, Christ was vindicated in the Spirit or by the Spirit, like we are referenced to the resurrection of Christ. And here, the, the nuance in First Timothy of the word It's still this vindicated sense. It's still a declaration of righteousness, but it is a declaration of one's righteousness by the very display of that righteousness. I'm declaring it by displaying it. Christ wasn't made righteous or declared positionally righteous. Rather, he was shown to be righteous by his resurrection. His eternal righteousness, he had always been righteous, was vindicated or shown or evidenced as true in the eyes of men, in the eyes of angels, and then recognized and proclaimed by the nations. So look back to James 2.18. 2.18. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Just as James said that his own faith would be shown by his works, he was saying the same is being said about Abraham in verse 21. He's speaking in terms of a context of demonstrating and showing his faith. And so in the same sense in verse 21, Abraham's righteousness was vindicated or shown to be true by his works. Remember, Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, we are not saved by works, but by faith. Then we walk in good works for which we are created. Faith is completed by good works. It accomplishes its end. God doesn't design for faith to come into the life of a believer and not to result in works. And this is what it means in James 2.23. We are declared righteous positionally at salvation, And we then begin to progressively be made more holy and more righteous through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's what we call progressive sanctification. And when that sanctifying work 
will finally be completed is when Christ is manifested in his return and we see him as he is and we will finally be made like him in that life, not in this one. We're getting closer, but we will never attain to that standard until Christ makes us like him when we see him as he is, and that's 1 John 3. And that is the point in James 2, 22. He says, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of his works, faith was perfected, or, or completed is another way. Abraham's faith was far from perfect. He would continue to sin like we all do, but when his faith was followed, by the necessary fruit of justification, of genuine faith, it produced good works. James says it was completed. Faith accomplishes its goal in bringing about good works in Abraham's life and in the lives of all of God's children. This is what James 2 is about. Abraham is an example of a man whose faith was shown to be genuine, a man who was shown to be righteous, not perfectly righteous, but progressively, who demonstrated the genuineness of his faith by the necessary fruit of that faith in good works. And that's actually made abundantly clear in verses 23 and 24. Let's read verses 23 and 24. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. There is positional justification, and he was called the friend of God. In verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. You might be reading these two verses and asking, well, how does that clear it up? Verse 24 says that man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And this is challenging at first glance, but think back. Think back to James 2.21. I'll read it again. Was not Abraham our father justified by works or declared righteous by his works or shown to be righteous by his works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you remember where this occurred in Genesis? What chapter was this? If you have cross-references in your Bible, on verse 21, you might have a reference to Genesis 22, verse 9. And so Genesis 22 is when Abraham's obedience to God and going up to sacrifice his son Isaac is what, that's, that's the event that James looks back upon as saying that vindicated and demonstrated his righteousness. Um, Hebrews eleven nineteen tells us that so, his faith was actually so confident that God had promised that his descendants would be named through Isaac that he, he was absolutely confident in what he had believed, that God's word was true, that God would keep his word And so if God promised to name his descendants through Isaac and Isaac was about to be killed, he knew that God would raise him from the dead. That's what Hebrews 11 tells us. He believed, he acted in obedience, believing that God's word was true. So the word believed in verse 23 is the word for faith. And so now in telling us this, he's been talking about the Genesis 22 event of Abraham being shown to be righteous or justified by his works when he went to offer up Isaac. And that was in Genesis 22. But now in verse 23, he says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Well, this sounds like positional justification. He's being declared righteous based upon his faith. So where does this quote come from? You ever saw reference to this? Genesis 15. Genesis 15. If you do the math, 15 comes before 22. So he has been talking about Genesis 22 and Abraham's obedience his faith-filled obedience demonstrating his righteousness, and then he switches gears and points us back earlier, decades earlier in Abraham's life to Genesis 15. And he communicates the truth of Abraham being declared righteous by his faith. So what's the connection 
between Genesis 15 and 22 in James's argument. And look at verse 23 again. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled. What scripture was fulfilled? Genesis 15. Genesis 15 teaches about God's righteousness being credited to Abraham's account by faith. So how was that fulfilled by Abraham later being justified by works or demonstrated righteous by works? When Paul speaks of justification and he specifically speaks about us being declared righteous. He's focused on our positional standing before God, declared righteous in the eyes of God. When James uses the word justification, he is bringing out a different nuance of the same word. Paul means the forensic status change of being positionally declared righteous. James means the declared righteousness before men by the demonstration of that righteousness or the evidence of one's practical righteousness resulting from salvation, which is why he points us back to where that began. The, the resulting righteousness that was demonstrated in Genesis 22 was began decades earlier in Genesis 15 when Abraham believed by faith. He was declared righteous long before his works. Abraham's demonstration of practical righteousness is actually said to fill up or fulfill what was said about him positionally decades earlier. Abraham, like all of us, was declared righteous when he was completely devoid of righteousness. He was empty of righteousness. But as God pardons us of our sin and works to make us more like his son, we begin to increasingly fill up what it means to be called righteous. Um, you don't have to turn there, but in Ephesians 4.1, this is what Paul describes as beginning to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. God has called us righteous, we begin to walk in that righteousness by faith, completing or bringing to completion our faith, as we see in verse 22. So lastly, verse 24 in this section is you see that a man is shown to be righteous by works that accompany his faith. Sorry, let me, let me, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. James 2.24, let me read it. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. A man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Armed with this contextual understanding of what James is saying, He's addressing a person who's claiming to be a believer. Also recognizing that language, different authors can employ terms. Different words have a nuance and a range of meaning. They're not disconnected from each other. But James is picking up on the nuance that's focusing not on the legal declarative act that we celebrate at the time of the Reformation and today, but he's focusing on the vindication aspect of it, the demonstration of righteousness. Paul and James are writing to two different audiences for different purposes, making different arguments and bringing out different nuances of the same word. But as we look at the details of James 2, we can see that their messages are very much aligned. And in both Romans and James, we find that the message that Abraham was justified, declared to be righteous and credited with God's righteousness by faith. And again, the necessary fruit of genuine faith is a life of ever-increasing conformity to God's righteousness. So this is what we are remembering when we talk about sola fide, the fact that salvation comes to us not by works, but by faith alone in the finished work of Christ. Uh, But there are works that he's prepared for us, and we are actually equipped to do them through our justification and our entry into the Spirit And now we have the ability to follow after him in in obedience and walk in those works that were created beforehand for us. And as we do that, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we are actually demonstrating the righteousness that God has begun to bring about in ourselves through his Holy Spirit, which will be completed when he returns. That's what we remember in faith alone. And so... After looking at the sufficient testimony of justification by faith from Scripture, 
For the last 10 minutes, we want to turn our our attention to the supporting testimony of justification by faith from church history. And I will, although we're only going to scratch the surface this morning, um, it's suffice it to say that God's Word speaks sufficiently to address this topic. Scripture alone is our authority. If a doctrine is taught clearly by Scripture, we can place our confidence in its truthfulness. But is this, this, is this the situation that we're left with, with justification by faith? Yeah, it's taught by Scripture, but is it really found nowhere in church history until 500 years ago? Was something as crucial as the true gospel completely lost through the first 1,500 years of the church? No. The reformers were not innovators. Instead, they were returning the church to the true gospel. The church had grown dark, but the gospel flame had never gone out completely. And so to show that, we're going to look at a few voices from church history as a very brief survey of a sampling of the church fathers from the first 400 years of the church, whose words should help us put to rest in our minds the notion that our theological heritage of justification by faith is just something relatively recent in the last 500 years. No, the true gospel believed and embraced was believed and embraced by a small remnant throughout church history. And then it was recovered and believed in mass during the Reformation. And so we want to look at a number of quotes this morning. And and this is really an attempt to just whet your appetite for a fantastic book, Smed mentioned a couple weeks ago, called Long Before Luther. If you haven't read it, it's at our book table. Um, It is, I should have brought it up with me, but it is Long Before Luther tracing the, tracing the, the history of justification by faith alone, by Christ alone, by grace alone, all the way back into the church fathers of the first century, the second century, the third century, all the way to the 1200s to to demonstrate and make, prove the point that this is not new. It was in scripture and it's been consistent throughout church history, even if it wasn't the predominant voice. So we're going to look at a few quotes this morning in the remaining time we have left, first let's look up a passage from Clement of Rome, who died around 100 AD. Listen to him explain that Christians, like Old Testament believers before him, are justified through faith apart from works. And so we, having been called through his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified through ourselves or through our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works that we have done in holiness of heart, but through faith by which the Almighty God has, a, has justified all who have existed from the beginning, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Justi- notice justification by faith, not by works, already present, 100 AD in the church. Even Origen, who certainly had his own theological issues, who wrote in the later 100s to died around 254 AD, even he saw the clarity of the doctrine of faith alone when he commented on Paul's teaching in Romans 3.28. He is saying that justification of faith alone suffices so that the one who only believes is justified even if he has not accomplished a single work. This isn't new. Origen later went on to point to the example of justification apart from works by looking to the thief on the cross. And then in the 4th century, Hilary of Poitiers, writing from 300 to 368, wrote on the nature of faith as being a gift of grace, as we looked at this morning, and not a work. He says, wages cannot be considered a gift because they are due to work, but God has given free grace to all men by the justification of faith. For Hillary, sinners are justified not on the basis of law-keeping or personal merits. Otherwise, justification would be considered a merit, a wage, not a gift. And this truth was so prominent for him that in his commentary on Matthew, he uses the phrase, a variant of the phrase that faith justifies over 20 times. So this is a big theme for him in the fourth century. 
Well, next we look at Ambrose, writing at the latter part of the fourth century, the famous preacher of Milan, who states, it is not because of your efforts, but because of the grace of Christ. By grace you have been saved, says the apostle. Therefore, it is not a matter of arrogance, but faith. The fourth century anonymous Pauline commentator known as Ambrosiaster commented on Romans 3.24. They are justified freely because while doing nothing or providing any repayment, they are justified by faith alone as a gift of God. Our works aren't repaying God. Our works are done out of gratitude and obedience and humble obedience because we desire to honor and please our Savior John Chrysostom wrote, and he often spoke of justification in the context of grace, faith, and even faith alone, and commenting on Acts 15.9, that God cleanses the hearts of Gentiles by faith, Chrysostom wrote, from faith alone, he says, they obtained the same gifts, referring to the Jews. This is also a lesson to those objectors that This is able to teach them that faith alone is necessary and not works or circumcision. Commenting on Romans 5, he emphasized that the sinner contributes nothing in salvation and that God is the one who accomplishes everything. He writes, He died for us and further reconciled us and brought us to himself and gave us grace unspeakable, but we brought faith alone only as our contribution. Well, the church fathers also talked about Abraham as the example of faith, like we did this morning. Justin Martyr said, for Abraham was declared to be righteous, not on account of circumcision, but on account of faith. Similarly, Irenaeus of Lyons All who, following the example of his faith, that is Abraham's, trust in God, should be saved. For he learned from the word of the Lord and believed him. Wherefore, it was accounted to him by the Lord for righteousness. For faith towards God justifies a man. The voices of church history were not silent. Uh, Chrysostom writes on Abraham. The patriarch Abraham himself, before receiving circumcision, had been declared righteous on the score of faith alone. The church fathers also wrote on the forensic nature of justification. Uh, Chrysostom wrote, what does the word justified mean? It means that if there could be a trial and an examination of the things that God has done for the Jews and of what had been done on their part toward him, the victory would be with God and all are right on his side. Christostom understood the legal context and the forensic nature of justification. It was a verdict in which God, which, which right is pronounced to lie with the one party in a dispute. And, and later commenting on Romans, Christostom said, Paul does not say it is God who forgave our sins, but what is much greater, it is God who justifies. For when the judge's sentence declares us just, and he is a judge such as one that we have here, what can the accuser say? And so we should not be afraid of trials either because God is for us and has shown he is for us by what he has done. Nor should we fear Jewish triflings about the law, for he has both elected and justified us. The church fathers also wrote at length about the distinction between justification and sanctification. Polycarp wrote in the first century in his letter to the Philippians, I also rejoice because your firmly rooted faith, renowned from the earliest time, still perseveres and bears fruit to the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that by grace you have been saved, not because of works, but by the will of God through Jesus Christ. Let's skip to two slides to the slide by Origen. Origen makes the root fruit distinction explicit. And this faith, when it has been justified, is firmly embedded in the soil of the soul 
like a root that has received rain, so that when it begins to be cultivated by God's law, branches arise from it that brings forth the fruit of works. The root of righteousness, therefore, does not grow out of the works. Let me read that again. The root of righteousness, therefore, does not grow out of the works, but rather the fruit of works grows out of the root of righteousness. That root, of course, of righteousness that God also credits even apart from works. That's really all we have time today. Um, We should be, as a takeaway, we should be exceedingly grateful for the courage and faithfulness of the reformers. We remember 506 years ago when the reformers in large part recovered the gospel for the church. When we talk about the reformers in church history, it's a reminder that our theological heritage is not just 500 years old, but goes all the way back to Christ. And throughout church history, there has always been a voice, however small at times, of a true gospel witness. And today we just looked at a handful of quotes from the first 400 years of church history. But if we had more time, we, would, we could have looked at the testimony of the, to the doctrine of justification by faith alone in the life of Augustine and Cyril of Alexandria in the 400s, of, of Fulgentius from the 500s, of Ildefonsus and Julian of Toledo from the 600s, of Bede from the 700s, of Simeon in the 900s, of Ansem of Canterbury from 1022 to 1109, or Bernard of Clairvaux who lived through the second half of the 12th century. We might even look to those pre-reformers, John Wycliffe in the 1300s, John Huss who lived in until 1415, and these men paved the way for the 16th century reformers like Luther and Calvin. Again, all of this has been a remembrance of what God's word says about justification by faith alone, and also a teaser, an advertisement for Nathan Busnett's book, Long Before Luther, Tracing the Heart of the Gospel from Christ to the Reformation. It's a red book, cannot commend it enough. 